All right, everyone, I think we should uh, start it. Uh, good morning. No, I have this. Yeah, I'm good. Louder? All right, okay, good. Um, good morning, everyone. So my name is Alison Watri, and I'm here as a chair for the scientific symposium, uh, and together with uh, Jennifer Braswell, who is the executive director of this uh, scientific symposium, would like to welcome you to this um, uh, nicely uh, done agenda that you're going to have for throughout the day, and uh, starting with this um, morning session. I would like to thank um, both the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine and the Sanford Consortium for the uh, nice, nice, nice organization that you have throughout the, the symposium, and also the scientific sponsor, uh, the Sanford uh, Stem Cell Clinical Center, um, and, and, and I also would like to, uh, to acknowledge the private uh, sponsors, and especially the platinum sponsor, uh, Thermo Fisher, who has been um, uh, supporting us throughout the years. So um, the last but not the least, I really would like to, to thank all the faculty and uh, supporters that have been uh, working in this past year, uh, not only to suggest names, but to make sure that we have uh, a, a nice agenda with uh, nice names and topics, hot topics uh, for this day. So these are uh, the people who actually uh, contribute and donate their time in, um, on, on, on helping to craft this agenda. So some of you may actually have noticed that uh, this year the name has changed from um, stem cell meeting on the mesa to cell and gene meeting on the mesa. And, um, there are many reasons for that, but basically what, what happens is that we become more inclusive. Uh, so stem cells continue to be like the core of that, but you're going to see some uh, new names uh, that are attracted to stem cells but have never been the opportunity to, uh, to be at this meeting and talk. Amy Pasquinelli, Shandong Fong, Shandong Fu. So these are names that have been uh, at UCSD but actually never heard about this meeting before. So now I think we can... Uh, incorporate all the uh, diverse expertise that we have on campus and make this meeting uh, even better, more multidisciplinary. So, as I said, I mean, the stem cell core uh, is still what moves, or, or, or at least how this meeting has uh, started, and similar to what we see in the body, we really need really good pluripotent stem cells uh, to create multipotent stem cells and a progeny of cells uh, that, if you have the right environment, can flourish. And uh, as the pluripotent stem cell uh, leaders, I would say, in this meeting, we have uh, many names. I would just mention a few. This is Larry Goldstein, Silva Evans at UCSCG, Jean Loring here, even Snyder at the Burnham. Uh, to me, in particular, uh, one guy who actually attracted me the most was uh, Rusty Gage. And because of this article, when he was claiming that he was able to reconstruct or reinvent the brain, I was able to come from Brazil, attracted to do a postdoc here uh, on the Mesa with Rusty Gage here at the SOC. And so I can consider myself one of these uh, 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 differentiated cell types from this uh, lineage tracing protocol here. Um, and uh, it's such a very uh, nice and supportive environment that I was able to find this picture here. So this is in 2006, actually the very first stem cell meeting on the Mesa where I was able to to create an enthusiasm on the audience just by showing some beautiful picture of human neurons uh, in the screen. The audience was, oh, it's uh, 10 years ago. And, uh, uh, and by the way, you can all find, you can all watch all the videos from the previous um, uh, meetings uh, in the Science Network uh, website. This was beautifully done and organized by uh, Roger Bingham, who has been recording these past meetings um, for the past 11 years, actually. So, but going back to, to stem cells, and just before I introduce you to the keynote morning speakers, um, one of the key ideas that was, uh, 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 was able to attract people to California was really this um, concept of stem cell therapy, that you can use these pluripotent stem cells to generate uh, derivatives that could be transplanted back into a patient that is missing that specific particular subtype of cells. Uh, we all been ignoring a spe a specific small details, which is the fact that those cells are not the same from the patients, and that may create or generate some um, uh, rejection on the tissue and, and other problems as well. So um, it was um, exactly 10 years ago when uh, Shina Yamanaka showed us that we can actually, um, by generating a skin biopsy of the live individual, the live patient, reprogram or induce the cells to this pluripotent state and then use these um, cell types uh, to complete the circle. So these are actually 
the cell types from the patients. Some of us are really not interested in the transplantation aspect, but we can use this model uh, to really understand the basic uh, cellular mechanisms of the disease. You can actually uh, go in deep and try to understand what are the uh, molecular mechanisms uh, behind the pathology. And you're gonna hear through, throughout the day that many of us are also trying to use uh, the system to screen drugs, repurpose drugs, so we can speed it up clinical trials, we can start treating patients. So um, I believe that um, our next speaker will talk a little bit about um, all of that. And going back to this lineage tracing here, um, uh, Jun Takahashi was also a postdoc with Rusty Gage. So in a way, we are brothers uh, from Brazil and Japan. And, and June is now a professor at the CIRA. CIRA is the uh, Center for IPS uh, Cell Research uh, and Application. This is in Kyoto University. It was established in 2010 by Shina Yamanaka. Uh, he was one of the uh, first professors to join CIRA. Uh, June has graduated from the Kyoto University and, 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 and he has a medical degree. He was a neurosurgeon working on uh, deep brain stimulation and, and also using uh, fetal cells for Parkinson transplantation. That's actually what attracted him to the Salk Institute and work with Rusty Gage uh, on the application of neurostem cells. Uh, perhaps in, in, in vitro would be like a better model for transplantation. This was in 96 and, uh, 95 and 96. So in 2012, he became like a full professor at CIRA and continued to develop this protocol. And I believe he would uh, be talking about his preclinical studies that he's doing um, uh, on the use of iPS cells for Parkinson's disease. He's not uh, only trying to purify or create better dopaminergic neurons, uh, but also really worry about uh, what's the kind of environment that uh, these cells will receive upon transplantation in the brain. So please welcome uh, Jun Takahashi. Thank you. Yes, I'm Jun Takahashi from Saira, Kyoto University. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, 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 Professor Muturi, Muturi and Jennifer and all the organizers uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. And also, yes, I, as I, I, he mentioned, uh, I was working in the Rusty Gage's lab, and I'm so happy to be here and give a talk to you. And uh, <coughs> so today I'm going to talk about uh, stem cell-based therapy for Parkinson's disease. As you know, so Parkinson's disease is a progressive degeneration of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, which causes motor symptoms including akinesia, rigidity, and tremors. So in Parkinson's disease, the amount of dopamine decreases in the substantia nigra and in the, in the stridum. So the patients will take medicine, L-dopa. So L-dopa works very well, but there is an important point that is the, not the L-dopa, but the dopamine works. And that dopamine is produced by dopaminergic neurons. So that means the dopaminergic neurons are necessary for the effect of L-dopa. But the number of dopaminergic neurons decreases day by day, and it's progressive. So at a certain point, the medical treatment alone cannot control the symptoms. That is the reason why cell-based regenerative medicine is needed. So cell-based regenerative medicine can be divided into two parts. One is cell engineering, and the second is cell transplantation. So today I will introduce our trial for the uh, application of iPL cell-derived dopaminergic neurons to the Parkinson disease patients. So yes, so we are working in Saira. So we use iPS cells. And uh, our iPS cells are derived from peripheral blood. And these reprogramming factors are introduced by using episomal vectors. And for the establishment, we do not use uh, mouse fetal, fetal, fetal cells anymore. Instead, we use uh, laminin fragment 511. So we, we do the fetal free culture. 
Okay, so now we have uh, IPS cells. <coughs> so the next question is how can we induce the functional dopaminergic neurons? So as you know, the midbrain dopaminergic neurons are located in the ventral region of the midbrain. <coughs> and the induction of the neural lineage cells can be performed uh, from the pluripotent stem cells can be performed by inhibiting BMP signals and nodal activating TGF signals, which is called dual smart inhibition. And further induce the ventral mesencephalon, we use FGF8 and wind, wind signals and sonic edge horn, which is called fluoroploid based differentiation. Most of them are uh, developed by a doctor uh, Studer. So by, the, by using these techniques, we are able to induce the dopaminergic protein cells or dopaminergic neurons. But when you think about the clinical application, you have to think about uh, several things like uh, scalability or homogeneity or safety and efficacy. For example, the culture, the component of the cultured cells is uh, heterogeneous like this. So when you induce the dopaminergic neurons, there are a variety of cells in the culture. Like, for example, if the neural precursor cells or undifferentiated IPS cells remains, it may cause tumors or neural overgrowth. Or other type of neurons may cause dyskinesia. Or mature dopaminergic neurons are too fragile to survive in the brain. So the previous study revealed that the best donor cells are dopamine progenitor cells. But how can we get dopaminergic progenitor cells? So we took a strategy of cell sorting. But nobody knew about the cell surface marker for the dopaminergic progenitor cells. So we took advantage of choline. Choline is not a specific marker of dopaminergic progenitors, but it is a marker for the fluoroplate. The midbrain dopaminergic neurons are generated from midbrain part of fluoroplate. So we thought if you induce midbrain tissues and take the fluoroplate cells, we are able to enrich the midbrain dopaminergic neurons. So actually, so we succeeded to enrich the TH positive dopaminergic neurons in the, uh, by sorting the choline positive cells from the mouse ear cell cultures. So we applied this technique to human iPS cells and we induced neural cells and sought the choline positive cells. So in this study, we injected the unsorted or choline positive cells into the rat Parkinson's disease model, rats. So grafted, human cells can be identified this green color and dopaminergic neurons can be identified by, by red color of staining for TH, tyrosine hydrosis, a marker for the dopaminergic neurons. So as you can see here, we were able to enrich the density and total number of dopaminergic neurons in the graft. So that means we succeeded to enrich the dopaminergic neurons by sorting choline positive cells. Okay. So next concern, uh, so, so, so by these techniques, well, we are able to uh, enrich the dopaminergic neurons. So next concern is tumorigenesis. So what kind of cells may contribute to tumor formation? This is our protocol, so, but I don't have enough time to explain this, but in our protocol, we sold the cells on day 12 and graft the cells on day 28. But to identify the proliferating cells for sure, in this study, we grafted unsorted cells on day 19. 
because day 19 spheres will grow uh, faster than day 28 cells. So we grafted and sorted day 19 cells into the mouse brain, and we found that the graft expand like this. But great growth rate becoming uh, sm slower and slower. And also, we found that proliferating cells in the graft, I mean the KI67 positive cells, uh, decreased day by day. So that means the neuronal differentiation proceeded in the brain after transplantation. This is the histology of the graft after transplantation. At four weeks, we found, we observed the rosette formation like this, and these rosette forming cells are actively divided. And the double coating, this is a marker of newborn neurons, and double coating positive cells were located outside the neural rosette. And the number of dopamine, uh, double coating neurons uh, increased at eight weeks, and the proliferating cells decreased. So when we examined these rosettes, we found that these rosette-forming cells expressed early neural cell markers, SOX1 and PAX6. So we think the rosette-forming, these early neural cells might contribute to tumor formation or neural overgrowth. But good thing is the expression pattern of choline in SOX1 or PAX6 is different. So choline is expressed in the uh, ventral region from the mesencephalon to the spinal cord, but SOX1 and PAX6 are located in the telencephalon or ventral side. So either SOX1 or PAX6 are not expressed in the mesencephalic floor plate here. So that means theoretically, so we can eliminate these proliferating cells by sorting chlorine positive cells. Actually, we confirmed that we eliminate these SOX1 or PAX6 positive cells by sorting chlorine positive cells. And when we grafted the day 28 cells into the rat, after 16 weeks, the volume of the grafts uh, larger in the case of unsorted cells. But in the case of chlorine positive cells, all the grafts are very small, and the percentage of proliferating cells are very, very low and almost zero in the case of chlorine positive cells. So that means the sorting is also beneficial in terms of safety of the donor cells. So, so SOX1 positive six PAX6 cell rosette forming cells may contribute to the tumor formation, but these are eliminated by current based sorting. Okay. And in addition, so we uh, recently we have identified novel cell surface marker for dopaminergic progenitor cells, which is LRTM1. This molecule is uh, expressed commonly both in the, uh, in the midbrain lmx one a positive cells and chloroplate chlorine positive cells. And also, by sorting LRT and one positive cells, we can enrich the dopaminergic progenitor cells. But anyway, so based on these results, we have established a manufacturing protocol towards the clinical application. So with the laminin 511 and the cell sorting of chlorine positive cells. So the characteristics of these donor cells are like this. So survival rate is uh, 96%, and the purity of TUJ1 positive, FOX8 positive, that means the fluoroplate neuronal cells are 98%. So at the time point of transplantation, these cells are still progenitor cells. But if we continue 
the differentiation culture. So these cells are able to produce dopamine or exhibit the potential action, action potential, like this. Okay. So now the cells or donor cells are ready. So next question is, do these cells function in the brain, especially in the monkey brain? So we would like to, I would like to emphasize that monkey is not a large sized mouse, rather than that it is a small sized human. So we can learn a lot of things from the monkey study. So I will introduce a part of them. So in this study, we have established four iPSL lines from four healthy do uh, donor cells, uh, uh, donors. And we established four iPS cells from three Parkinson's disease patients. And we compared these iPS cells. This graph shows the change of Parkinson's disease score and from uh, before and after transplantation. So we observed, in this case, we observed one year, 12 months. So as you can see here, uh, in the case of the monkey with the dop dopaminergic neurons from healthy volunteers or Parkinson's disease patients show, showed gradual improvement. So this graph shows the rate of the improvement and in both cases, they showed the significant improvement after transplantation. So that means even the dopaminergic neurons from patient-derived iPS cells can work in the monkey brain. Okay. And we also perform the video-based analysis of spontaneous movement of the monkeys before and after transplantation. I will show the video. So this is uh, the monkey before transplantation. But this monkey is MPTP-treated monkey. So like Parkinson's disease patient, a monkey cannot move so much, or they have the rigidity or some tremors. So he is thin still. This is a monkey before transplantation. Okay, so 12 months after transplantation, the monkey became more alert or may pay more attention to outside. And he can move more smoothly than before. And also he showed a variety of movement. Okay. So to quantify the volume of movement, we counted the pixels of monitors with change. So this number shows the change of the pixels. And when he changed the position, the number will be about 55,000. And when he walked, the number will be 10,000. So we counted the time of this movement. So for example, the, mo <coughs> the movement more than 5,000 pixels goes like this. So in this case, only the monkey with transplantation showed the significant increase the, this type of movement before and after transplantation. And we, when we counted the movement more than 10,000 pixel change. We, again, we found only the monkey with cell transplantation shows the significant increase of the movement. So that means the cell transplantation increased the volume of movement, spontaneous movement of the monkeys. 
Okay. So to evaluate the function of the cells in the brain, so we perform the PET study. For example, f dopa PET is for to detect the dopamine synthesis, and uh, PE2I is for the D dopamine reuptake from the dopamine transporter. So as you can see here, uptake of these PET ligands increase after transplantation. So that means the grafted cells function as a dopaminergic neurons in the brain. And PK is to detect the inflammation by the host brains. In this case, we did not observe the increase of the uptake of PK because we used immunosuppression by FK506 in this case. So there is no immune response. FLT is for the proliferation of the cells. Of course, there is no uptake of FLT. That means the grafted cells did not proliferate in the brain. Okay, so how about the survival? This picture shows the immunostaining for TH. So this is MPTP treated monkey. So the dopaminergic neurons or dopaminergic fibers degenerated. So the staining of TH is very, very weak in the control monkeys. But in the case of the monkey with cell transplantation, they show the intense staining in the graft site. And not only that, but for the entire foramen and even the caudate nucleus is stained with TH. That means the grafted cells survive in the, in the putamen and also extended axons to cover all the putamen. Now this picture shows the higher magnification of the grafted cells. And this is a host dopaminergic neurons in South Niagara. So as you can see, the morphology and the size of the grafted cells is very similar to the host dopaminergic neurons. So that means that they are very, very mature dopaminergic neurons. The HE staining showed that there was no abnormal structures or abnormally uh, proliferating cells, dividing cells in the graphs. And about 64,000 TH positive dopaminergic neurons survived in each hemisphere. And these cells expressed DAT uh, dopamine transporters, or TH, uh, and very similar to the host dopaminergic neurons. So that means the answer is yes, the human iPS cell derived dopaminergic neurons can survive and function in the monkey brain and improve the Parkinson's disease symptoms. And in this study, we observed at most two years, but even in two years, we haven't, uh, we have found that there is no tumor formation. Okay. So now we confirm the function of the cells in the monkey brain. So next question is autologous or allogenic transplantation, which is better? Because one of the advantages of iPS cells is that we are able to do the autologous transplantation. So this is a scheme of autologous transplantation. And we confirmed that at least sporadic Parkinson disease patients, iPS cells can, uh, can generate the uh, good, good dopaminergic neurons. And to confirm the immune response in the case of autologous and allogenic transplantation, we performed this study. We established iPS cells from uh, cyanomorous monkeys and we induced the dopaminergic neurons, and we grafted the same dopaminergic neurons into the original monkeys as autologous transplantation, and uh, injected into another monkeys with different MHC as allogenic transplantation. So we compared directly them in four pairs, and we found 
in the case of autologous transplantation, there is no or minimum immune response by the host brain and the good survival of the pharmacologic neurons. But in the case of allergenic transplantation, without immunosuppression, we observed the immune response. I mean the activation of microglias and accumulation of lymphocytes. But this response was not so severe to remove all the grafted cells. So because the brain is known as the privileged site for immunological reaction. So, but autologous, trans, uh, autologous transplantation is costly and uh, laboratorious. So for the reality, allergenic transplantation might be better for now. But in that case, we need the immunosuppression. So reduce, to reduce the immunosuppression, uh, to re immune response, we are planning to use the HLA homologous, homozygous iPS cells. As you may know, our institute are is establishing the iPS cell stock for allogenic transplantation. And we are establishing the iPS cells from HLA homozygous donor for at least HLA A and B and DR are homozygous. So if you establish the iPS cells from this patient and treat with donors, these iPS cells can cover these patients. And by the calculation, 75 such donor cells can cover 80% of the Japanese population. And most frequent HLA haplotype can cover 17% of the Japanese population. And now, the, we, Saira, already have established the most frequent HLA haplotype iPS cells and this with clinical grade. And these iPS cells were already delivered to some uh, universities and companies. But we do not know how much the immune response can be reduced by this type of image matching. So to address these questions, we have performed this type of study. We have, with the collaboration of, with uh, Dr. Shina and Ogasawara, we have MHC homozygous monkey. And we have established the iPS cells from this monkey and induced the dopaminergic neurons. And we grafted these dopaminergic neurons into the completely different MHC unmatched monkey, four monkeys, and hetero matched monkeys without immune suppression. We found the increase of KTP methionine. This is another marker for the immune response, inflammation. We only found the increase of KTP in the case of mismatched monkeys. And also, we found that activation of microglia was significantly reduced in the heteromatched monkeys, and also the accumulation of CD45 positive leukocytes are reduced in MSC matched transplantation. Okay, so no immune suppression was needed for autologous transplantation, and also immune response can be reduced by this MSC matching. So from these results, we know that host environment is also important, plays important roles. Because host environment can affect the cell survival or neurite extension or synapse formation of the func or the function of the grafted cells. So we are also trying to optimize the host environment. So I will introduce one of uh, our studies. So in this case, we 
tried to find a factor to promote synapse formation. In this, the grafted cells need to make a synapses with host neurons, but with what neuron? So we thought the neurons connected with grafted cells will be the neurons innervated by midbrain dopaminergic neurons. So to identify these neurons, we used WGA. This is a transsynaptic tracer. So we injected WGA into the midbrain, and this WGA was incorporated into the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, and this WGA was transferred through the axons to the striatum. And this WGA was transmitted transsynaptically to the neurons in the striatum. So that means these WGA positive neurons are innervated by the midbrain dopaminergic neurons. So next question is, what are they? We found that these WGA positive cells expressed DARP32 and not choline acetyl transferase. So that means these innervated neurons are medium spiny neurons in the striatum. So next, we uh, sought the WGA positive cells, and we found that these WGA positive cells expressed more uh, dopamine receptors compared to the WGA negative cells. Then we compared the gene expression profiles between WGA positive cells and negative cells. And we found the several uh, candidate genes uh, more abundantly expressed in the WGA positive cells. In this study, so we focused on the cell adhesion molecules, and these are the files or the candidates of the genes. So I don't have enough time to explain all of this, but we found that at least uh, specifically uh, integrating alpha-5 and semaphorin 7A were exclusively expressed in the WGA positive cells, and we found that integrating alpha-5 is expressed in the abundantly in the striatum. So as you may know, integrating alpha-5 will make the heterodimer with integrating beta-1. So we confirmed the expression of integrating alpha-5 and beta-1 in the striatum. And also we confirmed that these integrating alpha-5 positive cells expressed DAP32 or WGA. So that means that neurons inhibited by the midbrain dopaminergic neurons are medium spiny neurons, and integrating alpha-5 and beta-1 plays an important role for the, this type of connectivity. So next question is, how can we activate these integrins? The previous study reveals that the signals from the really activate the integrin alpha-5 beta-1, and the expression of reading can be upregulated by the estradiol, sex hormone estradiol. So we hypothesize that if we administrate the estradiol, we might be able to increase or activate the integrin alpha-5 beta-1. So we injected estradiol into the rat for seven days daily, and we, confirmed, we found that the expression we integrated alpha-5, beta-1, and the activated uh, beta, integrin beta-1 is increased. Okay, so now the host environment is ready. So next, we established the WGA expression iPS cells and induced the dopaminergic neurons and grafted into the rat Parkinson's disease models and performed the behavioral examination. So we, got, we found that the behavior improvement was accelerated by adding, by injecting the estradiol. And at that point, at this point, 
we performed a histological study and found the neurons in the striatum, the, uh, the DAP32 positive cells and WGA positive cells, increased with estradiol and uh, reversed by its inhibitor. So that means by the synapse formation between grafted cells and host neurons can be promoted by estradiol through the integrin alpha 5 beta 1. But this is one example of the host environment can be altered or optimized by the medical treatment. So that means the drug can change the function of the grafted cells. And it is vice versa. So we have to aware that the concept of drugs is changing in the cell-based therapy. And especially in the case of the neural transplantation, the grafted cells have to extend axons on and make synapses. And for such kind of make good synapses or right connection, I think the rehabilitation will work, uh, will play an important role by activity dependent manners. So the drugs and cells and rehabilitation, or I would say device, will work together for the successful transplantation. But cells are main player, of course. So this mutational work is very important. And not only that, for the application of the stem cells or the adaptation to the society of regenerative medicine, the new clinical grade operators and also regulatory science is also very important. So this is an image of my regenerative medicine. So this is what I would like to say most today. Regenerative medicine is a total work of art. So it is not inject, injecting the cells, but also the, a lot of factors may work together for successful regenerative medicine. So in summary, the induction of functional midbrain dopaminergic neurons from human iPL cells can be achieved now, and sorting of covering positive cells is beneficial in terms of safety and efficacy, and also the quality control. And at the same time, the optimization of host environment is also very important, and which is performed by medical treatment or rehabilitation or devices, and also gene therapy. Okay. Okay, finally, so I would like to thank all the lab members and my collaborators. Okay, thank you for your attention. Microphones in here, or uh, I think. Hi, Jane. That was very nicely done. Um, I had two questions. One about estradiol. The other one about cyclooxygenase. Jane. It's me, Kat. Hi. Uh, the one about estradiol. Um, when you do your transplants into male versus female recipients, considering the host environment, do you get better engraftment in female rats, for example, or female macaques? Uh, it's a very good point. In this case, we use the female rats, yeah. but we we don't have very, uh, enough data to answer that. But it's a very good point. It would be important clinically, obviously. And with uh, cyclooxygenase, have you thought of using aspirin or another cyclooxygenase inhibitor to reduce inflammation? Yeah, in the think, yes, yeah. I think it's very important to reduce the inflammation. It's a very very important key. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, this is Jean Loring from Scripps. Oh, yeah. Hi, Jean. Um, I want to ask you a sort of a big, pic a big picture question, which is that the entire field, I think, is moving forward in Parkinson's disease cell therapy. And one group has already started clinical trials, uh, the group that is transplanting cells in Melbourne. And I'm wondering what you think about their approach, which is to use neural stem cells rather than differentiated dopaminergic neurons. 
and you, what what you think will happen. You, 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 you're talking about the, the cases in Australia. Yes, Australia. Oh, yeah. Melbourne. Australia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, I studied the study, stem cell study with neural stem cells, and I found that at the stage of neural stem cells, it, the determination is already, the de uh, destination is already determined. And I found it is impossible to induce the authentic midbrain topomenagic from the neural stem cells. So that's why, that is the reason why I moved from the neural stem cell to more uh, prepotent stem cells. So I think, yes, we should, or, or we would better to use the prepotent stem cells. Can I follow that up just real quickly? So um, I think the, uh, their theoretical uh, mode of action is actually neurotrophic effects, and they're not so worried about dopaminergic differentiation at all. Their, their idea is to try to get more neurons to survive and branch. Um, do you think that that's, and there's anything like that going on in your system as well, any neurotrophic factors? You mean the, the neurotrophic factor? Yeah, that, that, yeah yes. to attract the yeah, yeah, support yes, the remaining yes. cells. Yeah, that, that kind of combination is important. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hi, June. Thanks. Dustin Wakeman, Rexgen. Uh, regarding your functional improvement in your motoric behavior that you showed that video, it was beautiful. I was wondering if you've broken those behaviors down into things like tremor, uh, slowness of movement, and, and how that might guide your patient selection, sort of what you're thinking as far as your patient selection for your clinical trial. You mean the, in the clinical, in the, the patient selection in the clinical trial? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So far, I think we will select the patient with uh, grade three or four with Parkinson's disease. But I don't, I don't identify any specific criteria for the treatment or like that. <laughs> but at least so we should not do the clinical trial for the patients with very severe drug-induced dyskinesia. Have you broken those motor behaviors down, though? You know, what is, your, what is the effect on, say, tremor versus slowness of movement or fine motor dexterity? So when you start breaking those behaviors down, sometimes you find that some of them tend to get better and some of them kind of stay the same. Uh, I, I don't have, yeah. So we have to do, we have to evaluate like that, so. I, I can talk okay. to you later. Thanks. Yeah. Jun, I, I also have a question. So I think it was not a total surprise to me to see that even the cells derived from the uh, Parkinson patients mm -hmm. also have an effect. Um, but what do you think is going to be the consequence at long term? You know, will these cells uh -huh. start to degenerate as well? Yeah, it's, it's also an important point. So we observed two years. And uh, these patients are sporadic patients. This is not a familiar patient. Yes, so we, so to answer that, so we have to uh, observe longer time point. Mm -hmm. And also another concern is these patient derived cells might be affected more easily, easily by the host right. environment. Right. So we are doing such kind of experiments now. So we, I hope we can report in the near future. Thank you for your nice talk. Uh, you, use, you used in this data uh, your epidermal vector and retroviral vector for iPS generation. Mm -hmm. which, which is the best uh, option uh, of vector system for clinical trials? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Lentiviral or piggyback or mRNA vector system? Which yeah. is the best? I don't know. So that kind of technique, technology is developing day by day. So I'm not, I'm not sure which is the best. But at least the important point is the uh, repro uh, reprogramming factor is not integrated into the genomes. And so far, so we are using the uh, retro, uh, episodal vectors. So, but in the future, so we will be able to use the better technology. Um, just a follow-up question. So this, this. Uh, this was EBV transfected cells, or, or you were using the same dye virus uh, to, 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 no. to deliver the, the factors? No, in, in, in our case, we use the uh, epithelial vectors. Okay. Yeah, but we are trying to another and uh, and uh, yes and uh, another type of IPS cells by using the same dye virus vector. Mm. All right. Yeah. 
Even for the monkey, uh, it's permanent. So you use IPI cell or the monkey embryonic stem cell to I generate the neuron cell. When you use the monkey model, so you use a monkey IPI cell mm -hmm. or you use a monkey embryonic stem cell? Oh. <coughs> for the first study, I use the human IPL cells. And the uh, second uh, study for the immune response, so we use monkey IPL cells. Okay, so yeah. you're able to generate the monkey IPL cells? Uh, we are able to generate monkey IPL cells? Uh, yes, yes, yes. All right, so if no more questions, let's thank June again. Thank you.